Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to the Video Guide to Drakenheim. This is part two of our video guide, where we're going to look at everything a Dungeon Master needs to know to run a Session Zero for a Drakenheim campaign to set your game up for success. Now, Session Zero is an important part of Dungeons and & Dragons and has become much more relevant in recent editions and recent years. Session Zero is the session that you have before you get started with your campaign, where you set some expectations, talk to your players about what they're going to be playing, and try to work together to make sure everybody's on the same page setting forth on your adventure. We've done a video in the past explaining Session Zero in more detail, which you can check out right up over there. Today, in this video, what we're going to do is focus on the essential Drakenheim pieces that you need to add to your Session Zero to make sure that the characters know what they're getting into. Session Zero is probably the single most important thing that you can do as a Dungeon Master to ensure that you're going to have an amazing and memorable campaign. But for Dungeons of Drakenheim, it is even more essential. Whether or not you are playing with a group of players that you've never run the game for before, or whether you're playing with a long-time group of friends. There's just a couple moving pieces in a Drakenheim campaign that really benefit from getting hammered out in a session zero. So let's go over them all today and get you ready to start playing your Drakenheim campaign. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. Now, before you even come to Session Zero, there are a few pieces of material that you can share with your players to get their creative energy flowing as they start thinking about their characters. First and foremost is our amazing intro cinematic that we made for the Kickstarter campaign. You can share this with your players. It's a perfect introduction to the campaign premise and the world of Drakenheim itself. You can also safely share with your players part one of this video series, which is gonna have a lot of great questions for them and an introduction to the world of Drakenheim itself. Now also, if you have your hands on the book or the PDF, you can share with your players chapter one of the book, which doesn't contain any spoilers, but sets up the expectations for the campaign. You can also share with them the appendix, The World of Drakenheim, if they want more information to help them flesh out their characters, as well as the appendix for character backgrounds, which has a lot of options that we think players should be using to really drive home the setting of Drakenheim in their character creation. But for yourself as a dungeon master, you will also want to read chapters two and three. Of course, we recommend reading as much of the book as possible to get ready for running your campaign. But if you want to get going, we do recommend at least reading chapter two and three, which has important information for you as a dungeon master to know about the setting, but information that you might not want to share readily with your players. Chapter 2 focuses on running the campaign as a whole, so it gives you a summary of how the adventure might go, as well as gives you a DM's eye view of the various things that you want to be thinking about going into Session 0. You're not necessarily going to want to share any of this information with your players. You don't want to spoil for, the, for them what happened to the royal family or any give away any of the secrets of the meteor, but you do want to have these things in mind as your players are choosing their personal quests and building out their backstories. Chapter 3 focuses on the factions that exist in Drakenheim. Now, factions are a key part of running the campaign, so understanding the faction's motives, goals, and personalities is going to be really important for you to keep in mind even on the outset of this campaign. Not only that, but working with your players as they design their characters to see what sort of relationships they might already have with existing members of the factions. There's a lot of personal quests or possible background options and other ideas that they might bring to the table that you can use to weave in to the faction intrigue, which is the meat of this campaign. Again, you don't need to share with them all the secrets of the factions, but if they are a mage-born sorcerer, you may want to talk to them about who they might know in the Amethyst Academy and what their relationship could have been with that faction. One of the strongest ways that you can connect your player characters to the events and characters in the world of Draken is keeping an eye out for if any of your player characters create an NPC as part of their backstories. There might be an opportunity for you to replace an existing NPC in the campaign with one of the ones that your players have created or vice versa. Don't be afraid to change the names of any of the non-player characters if that helps you build a relationship between that NPC and that player character. 
Also, it's worthwhile considering how the player characters might be able to share some NPCs as well. So as you're hearing about their backstories, keep this in mind and knowing who's in the factions, their leaders and lieutenants is a really helpful way of building those connections right from the start. Another really important part of your preparation as a DM is taking a look at the map of Drakenheim. This is going to be essential for your games and you will want to lay the map out in session zero and show all of the players the map of Drakenheim. Familiarize yourself with the different locations that are present on the map and the different roads and pathways that might lead them to their adventures. You are not spoiling anything for your player characters by sharing the city map with them. In fact, it's better to share it with your players because in many ways, them knowing that things like Castle Draken, the Academy Tower, and Queen's Park Garden, and Slaughterstone Square are out there is exciting for their imagination and gets them thinking about the places they might explore during the campaign. Don't hold the map back, share it with your players right from the get-go. So now that we've laid out your preparation for Session Zero, when you're jumping in with your players to Session Zero, what expectations should you set for the campaign? And I think first and foremost, one expectation that you need to set is that this is a dark fantasy cosmic horror campaign. Our campaign is full of crazy monsters, faction intrigue, a ruined city ravaged by civil war, and a dangerous mysterious meteor that has warped and changed things. There's a lot of elements that Monty and I have injected into this campaign from our favorite horror tropes, and we hope that that is relevant when you look through this book. Now, naturally, if you've watched season one of our live stream campaign, you can expect that your players are going to inject the campaign with a good dose of comedy and fun. That's their job, and you won't find much comedy and fun in the pages of the book. Don't worry, it's going to happen at your table. But you as a DM need to be prepared for the gritty realism and dark fantasy setting that is being portrayed by the city of Drakenheim. One of the other things that's really important to emphasize during Session Zero is that Dungeons of Drakenheim is a player-driven adventure. The player characters' choices and actions will have consequences. The player characters get to choose who their allies are and also their enemies will come out of their own choices and actions as well. This means that in D Drakenheim, there isn't really a clear cut answer. And so this is very much a campaign based around moral ambiguity. We recommend not fixating too heavily on alignment during character creation, nor during the campaign itself. This is very much a campaign where often good intentioned people have to do pretty bad things in order to bring about the outcomes that they want. And oftentimes, bad people can end up doing good things to serve selfish ends. This moral complexity and ambiguity is a really big theme in the campaign. And so really make sure that you set that expectation with your players that this is not a black and white world and they will often encounter situations where there is no right answer. It's up to them to decide what they want to do and what they want the world to look like. And with the heavy influence of faction intrigue at the core of this campaign and the player-driven focus, it's also really important to let your players know that this is not a Unite the Factions campaign. With the moral ambiguity and the choices that they make, there's not really an option here at the outset of the campaign for them to say, let's bring everybody together to save the world. This is gonna be a campaign where the choices they make are going to bring them head to head against some of the factions while working with others. And that is one of the core concepts that you need to make abundantly clear at the outset of this campaign. One other expectation that's really important to set with your players is the difficulty of the campaign and some of the special rules that are in play. Drakenheim is an open-ended campaign, and this means that the player characters can wander into more trouble than what they might have bargained for. You can openly tell your players that Encounter balance is not really a thing in Drakenheim. They can't really wander into every situation expecting every combat to be perfectly balanced and fair. There will be many combat encounters where they might even have to run and they can stumble into situations that are more than what their characters can handle on their own. This means that they will have to seek alliances with the factions if they're going to survive and obtain their goals. 
This is also where you're going to want to introduce to your players the core mechanic of the haze. Now the haze is a system that we've put in place that really turns Drakenheim into a dangerous location. The haze is a mysterious magical radiation that covers the entire city. In some locations in the city, it is more deadly than others. And at the back of the book, there is a map that gives you a loose idea on where you can expect the haze to be most concentrated. Now, as your players go into the city, one of the key aspects of the haze is that they are unable to take a long rest well inside the city of Drakenheim. The reason for this is very simple. Monty and I want the city of Drakenheim to be a place where explorers venture into and need to be concerned about how they're going to get to their destination and get back out again. We think that a lot of D&D is pretty liberal with being able to take long rests in between combat encounters and we want to push our players to have to think about their choices more severely. And at the outset of the campaign, it should be abundantly clear that they will have to deal with the haze, but also that there is no player options on the outset that allow them to ignore the haze. A lot of your player characters may ask questions like, if I'm Warforged or using Lehman's Tiny Hut or various other spells, will this allow me to take a rest in the haze? The answer is just a blanket no. The haze not only affects all creatures, but all substances as well. When they're navigating the ruins of Drakenheim, they may find buildings that have warped and changed from stone into flesh or glass. So when we look at other creatures or options, the haze penetrates all things, all spells, all creatures, all substances. The reason for this is that through the campaign itself and another core aspect of the story of Drakenheim is that the player characters will have to discover how to navigate deeper into the city and eventually avoid or navigate through dangerous haze problems. They'll discover new spells, new magic items, and new mechanics along the way to help them go further into the city. We find that it is very helpful to be transparent about how the haze works and also introduce the contamination mechanics to your players during session zero, because this will help avoid any frustrations or shock that your players might have when they encounter these for the first time in, in your game. It can be very tempting to want to hold back revealing some of these details until the players encounter them for the first time, but they're going to encounter them very, very earlier on the in the campaign. And the mystery is not so much about what these things do, but what caused them, where they came from and how to overcome them rather than about finding out that they're there. It's a well-established fact in the world of Drakenheim that these things happen, so it's not too much of a mystery to put on your players at the outset. One really fun thing that you can do is share with them the mechanics of how contamination works, but if you do want to keep a little bit of mystery, keep the table of mutations that they might get secret. Let them know that there are debilitating mutations that may occur as they gain contamination levels. But part of the fun of the game is rolling on the table and not knowing what's going to happen. So if you do want to keep that mystery, share you should share with them the mechanics but maybe not share with them what might happen to them. And through all this, you will want to share with them the mysteries of Delirium and how its origins are wholly unknown and still not fully discovered, although it has vast magical potential that makes it valuable for seeking out in the city. If any player character is at a loss for what motivates their character to come to Drakenheim, simply collecting Delirium to make some gold is the perfect starting point for their character. One last expectation to set with your players is that the campaign itself takes place in the city of Drakenheim. There shouldn't be much reason for them to want to leave the city. The book does include a map of the entire continent of Westamar and the surrounding areas like Caspia and Illyria. The players should feel free to use this map to explore their character backstories, maybe where they came from. Was it another city in the area, or was it from the lands of Caspia or Illyria? We left these locations relatively vague so that the players can imagine what they want to really bring their characters to life from being from a distant land. In our own campaign, Joe played Pluto Jackson, a Caspian knight, and he got to kind of make up what that meant for his character. So. Although the world is out there to be explored in their concepts and ideas, you as a DM should make a deal with your players that they are all dedicated to the idea of staying within the city or the immediate surrounding area, such as the town of Emberwood Village, which is the safe haven for them in their explorations. 
Keep the focus on the city itself. This is also why as your players invent backstories, goals, and objectives for their characters, you really want to make sure that those hone in on the conflict of Drakenheim itself. This is where the player character's personal quests come into play, and you need to be very firm that everyone does need to pick one, and if they don't, roll a d12, and that's the one they get. <laughs> uh, the personal quest is an essential rationale for why each character is adventuring in Drakenheim, and gives every player an individual objective to achieve during the campaign. And you want to tell them that when they achieve their objective, they're going to get a feat or an ability score increase. So bonus, they're motivated to do it for mechanical reasons too. <laughs> All of the personal quests drive your character's story towards the city of Drakenheim. As well, if they're choosing from the backgrounds detailed at the back of the book, this will hone in on them being from the lands surrounding Drakenheim and having a need to quest to the city. These two elements combined make sure that player characters have ample reason to explore the ruined, terrifying city of Drakenheim. And we think that part of Session Zero should be dedicated to not only talking about the personal quests of the players, but you as a DM should have an understanding and work with your players on how that's going to weave into the narrative. We've included options in the book on how the personal quests that they can choose from might play out in the campaign. But once you've read through the factions, the story, and all of the things that are going to be happening in Drakenheim, it's your job as a DM to take those backstories and start weaving them into the narrative. There's a lot of tools in the book to help you out with that, but it's a very important and key aspect of making sure that the story is directed towards the city of Drakenheim. In creating the personal quests, Kelly and I have tried to address many of the common motivations that players devise for their characters. Things like missing people, lost heirlooms, and tantalizing mysteries. And so we encourage you to use these personal quests either directly or as the basis for your own ideas that you work with those player characters on. A couple of the ones in particular that are really worth thinking about using are the personal quests that involve people. Drakenheim is a dangerous place. And many player characters often immediately come into Drakenheim with an idea of, ah, I have a missing f friend, family member, or a loved one somewhere in the ruins. You want to direct these players towards the personal quests that deal with missing people and remind them that anybody that goes missing in Drakenheim is usually dead within 72 hours or turned into a horrible monster. So if your player character is going to go with a missing person sort of narrative for their character motivation, you might want to remind them of this fact and that there's a good probability that their character might not have a happy ending to their personal quest unless they choose one of the ones that are formulated around perhaps their missing loved one getting tangled up in one of the factions. So because this is such a common motivator for many player characters, you may want to gauge very carefully what your player's expectations are because it's really cool to have a personal quest that's going to end in tragedy, but you want to make sure that your player is aware that that's what they're signing up for. In the original Drakenheim campaign, Jill, who played Veo Senya, was looking for her missing father. And I was really clear during Session Zero that I said, you're probably not going to find him in a state that he's ready to come back to life again in. This led to a very satisfying arc for her character and some phenomenal role playing, but it wasn't necessarily a happy ending. Along with that, another personal quest that you might want to pay close attention to is that your player character might choose to be an heir to the throne or an envoy of somebody who is the heir to the throne. Drakenheim represents a kingdom in ruin and the royal family is dead or missing. So there's a really fun element to play with where one of the factions, the Hooded Lanterns, is very dedicated to finding a new monarch to put on the throne. And your player character can play into that. But it's important to keep in mind and detail out to your players how the monarchy, religion, and magic work in our setting. Any player character could possibly choose to have their character related in some way to the royal family. They might even be one of the missing long-lost children of Ulrich von Kessel IV, or one of his nieces, nephews, cousins, or any relation you can devise. We've intentionally left the exact family tree of the royal family open-ended so that you can find different entry points for player characters that might want to take up this personal quest. The thing to remember is that any player character who is choosing this personal quest is in for a vexing challenge. 
and they will have to prove their legitimacy and their might to claim the throne if that's what they're looking for. With this personal quest, the player character shouldn't have it easy from the start. They should have to prove their lineage and also convince the other factions why they are the right one to take the throne. And there could be more complicating factors to it than that. In our world, there's a treaty called the Edicts of Lumen, which was designed in partnership between the monarchy, the faith, and the mages of the Amethyst Academy as a way to keep a balance of power within the continent. Arcane spellcasters are disinherited from royal and noble titles. This treaty is extremely important because for years it has kept the peace between the continents, between the faith, the mages, and the monarchy, there is a semblance of power where all three of them have a say in the political intrigue that captivates this campaign. So when your players set out to design their characters, they need to keep this treaty in mind when they are deciding what classes they might be playing and what personal quests they might be choosing. It's important to note that the Edicts of Lumen aren't something that makes magic illegal. It does give the Amethyst Academy the ability to take guardianship over anyone born with magical powers, but it doesn't mean that someone who wasn't taken in by the Amethyst Academy is somehow a fugitive for from the law. What it does do is that if you have a player character that wants to play a wizard and might want to have their character be related to the royal family, well, it creates a difficult situation if that player character wants to press a royal claim, because the Edicts of Lumen will be used against them in arguing for their legitimacy. This is a conflict that if your player character wants to take this on, power to them! It's an awesome story and a great conflict for their character, but it does mean that their personal quest might not be easy. <laughs> In a game of Drakenheim, none of the personal quests are meant to be easy tasks. So your player characters should feel free to explore the stories they want to tell, but should definitely have you, the DM, explain to them the way that the politics work in this campaign setting. They're going to be up against some very intense situations and some really important decisions that they're going to have to make that will decide the fate of Drakenheim. In the world of Drakenheim, the forces of magic are deeply mysterious and poorly understood. One of the things that makes the world of Drakenheim a little unique is that wizards and sorcerers alike both inherit their magic through their bloodlines. Wizardry just represents someone who was born a sorcerer, but trained really early from birth in focusing their inborn ma magical powers. It doesn't matter how much studying someone does, if they are not mage born, they cannot become a wizard. This is an important fact in the world as a whole, which has informed so many conflicts across the entire setting. How this affects the magic of bards, warlocks, and other classes is a little bit more mysterious, but the important takeaway of this is that anyone that does have arcane spellcasting capabilities rarely takes up a noble title or tries to press a royal claim, but your player characters could still try. In the same way, the divine entities are also mysterious in this campaign setting. The gods are distant and do not interfere with mortal issues. There is still religious faiths, and we have a prominent religious faith in the Sacred Flame, represented by the Silver Order. However, when your players are looking at playing a cleric or paladin, they should keep in mind that although they do have their divine powers and there are no limitations on playing these classes, that they will not be speaking necessarily directly to their gods. The powers granted to them are ones of a mysterious origin, and the faith that they have in these gods is something sort of nebulous in this setting. The gods are so mysterious and, and distant, in fact, that even if a cleric or paladin violates the tenets of their oath or their religion, they won't lose their divine spellcasting power. This can only really be caused by someone who has a personal crisis of faith, then they might lose their power. An evil character with strong convictions for the sacred flame can still maintain their divine connections and their spellcasting powers, even if they violate the tenets of the, of the religion. It's more about their personal faith that represents where their powers come from. When your players are designing a divine character or possibly even looking for inspiration for their druids or their barbarians or other characters who might honor gods, the the sacred flame represents the prominent religion. There is the followers of the falling fire, which is a splinter sect 
of that religion. Not only that, but there are a lot of people out there, like the Druids that you might find in the campaign, who worship older, more distant, and forgotten gods. And these are also an option. So again, your Cleric and Paladin, Druid, and other players don't need to dedicate themselves to the single religion, although it is a very interesting way to tie them into the narrative of the story. You should feel free to import whatever deities you like to be the old gods. And we think that when your players come to you with a concept for their character, work with them to see how they fit into the setting and weave them into the narrative. We want all options to be available in the setting and we think that players should explore how they're going to fit in. As we wrap things up, I'll just say that for myself, when I started the, the original Dungeons of Draconine campaign, I had only planned a fraction of the information that you have at your fingertips in the Dungeons of Drakenheim book. Your player characters are going to present you with creative ideas, and it's worth your time to find a way to make those work within the setting, or even change details as you need to to make it work as well. I think the most important thing with characters at the outset of the Drakenheim campaign is to have ones that are motivated and excited to explore the city and interact with the factions. Creating grounded characters that are just at the beginning of their adventuring careers are really, really exciting for the world of Drakenheim, especially gritty, grim, human adventurers that are really going to feel at home in that dark fantasy world. But you can take this in any direction you want to go, and so it's worth talking with your players about what their interests are and making adaptions as you need to to make it fit perfectly. Because Drakenheim is so focused on the city and the choices the players will make, their backstory only needs to give them enough motivation to come to Drakenheim and start interacting with the factions. You don't need to ask your player characters to make big, long, complex backstories for their player characters, and simply choosing a background and a personal quest is more than enough to really connect them to this world. In the worlds of Drakenheim, you should feel encouraged to allow all player options at your table. There's no reason why there shouldn't be Warforged or Aarakocra um, or Artificers in this setting. Such characters might be exceptionally rare, and you may not find many of them throughout the book, but keep in mind that the city of Drakenheim is the one place on this world that attracts all manner of interesting people to the ruins to go exploring. So let your characters be the oddballs, the strange and quirky weird ones, because those are pretty much commonplace in the city of Drakenheim. <laughs> they might be strange elsewhere in the world, but the people in and around Drakenheim are pretty used to seeing all manner of crazy creatures crawling around the ruins. You can justify almost any character as being a bizarre experiment of the Amethyst Academy or a traveler from a distant land. And for you as a DM, while you're working with your players, having an understanding of the politics, the factions, and the city itself is going to allow you to ground what they're creating in the campaign setting. And as you set out on your adventures in Drakenheim, we hope that you explore the amazing things that your characters are bringing to the table and the amazing adventures that you want to see happening at your table. We hope that this gives you everything that you need to get started with your Dungeons of Drakenheim campaign. And be sure to stay tuned for our next video, which is going to be diving into getting started with your first session.